Hey everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and in this episode of the Saturday Morning D&D Show, we talk about Numenera in Dungeons & Dragons, the new Kickstarter coming out in March, and we also talk about silly games versus serious games. Hello everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and this is the Saturday Morning D&D &D Show. I kind of messed up my intro there. I was like, what? Doing something different. Um, and this is the Saturday Morning D&D &D Show. I am joined always by my wonderful co-host, Sir Lucian, over at Sir Lucian Gaming. Say hello, sir. Hello everybody, welcome back. Saturday morning. Yeah. I'm almost over my cold. It's almost done. So almost done. Oh my goodness, you've been, hate. isn't that the worst when you're just sick for like two weeks and you're just like, go away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because now it's not sick enough that you can't do all the things you're supposed to do, but it's sick. You just, I'm stuffy a little bit. The voice is still a little off, but you've got to do all the other stuff that you normally do. Yeah, we, we didn't, I didn't put this in the show notes or anything, but it reminded me of one of my players, his, one of my Hot Springs Island players, his uh, kid has the flu and he sent us a message and he's just like, so I have like a mild symptoms, but I think I'm okay to come play. And I do like a quick Google search and I'm just like, you are contagious the day before you have symptoms. And so I'm like, please do not come to D&D. &D. And he was, he wasn't like hurt by it, but he was a little disappointed that he didn't get to play. But I'm just like, no, stay home. Like I do not, I can't get sick right now. Like I'm way yeah, too busy with work. I'm way too busy with other projects. <laughs> like just no, nobody wants the flu. Please stay home. Yeah, you got to wear the mask if you're coming. Yeah. And like the full decontamination. That's the only way. <laughs> we'll see if uh, we'll turn my house into the end of E.T. with all the plastic everywhere and stuff. So yeah. full hazmat but suits. Good old Saturday morning Dungeons and Dragons, which yeah. we love to talk about. So, Absolutely. So good. You ready to get to the news? Sure. What are we doing news-wise? I should probably look at the chat and see if people yeah. are talking. So, yeah. Are there. <laughs> Hello, Cyberwolf. Hello, Indoor Adventure. Hello, Lane Gwenlator, Lord of the yeah. Rings. So, welcome. That's good to have welcome. you guys out here. So, what wasn't big D&D &D news because we all expected really a big bomb to hit soon, like because all the hinting of the new book and we haven't had a lot of uh, information on the new stream that they're going to do for it, what's going to happen there. And it's supposed to all kind of be dropping fairly -ish soon because that happens in May. So they got to start the hype train at some point. But it feels like, nope, no hype train yet this week. Uh, we even talked just like within a few seconds before uh, the show started that even the Unearthed Arcana article isn't out quite yet. So, um, and that was at the end of February. So it was interesting to see that we still don't have that news. What we did do though, we did get to see is Monty Cook, who we both like from Numenera, is actually gonna release a 5e book. I'm gonna let you talk a second while I yell at my dog. Oh yeah, go ahead and yell at your dog, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, let me bring it up the, the thing here, but basically Monty Cook is going to take the, the world of Numenera and implant it into Dungeons and Dragons 5e. So they're the monster, the equivalent of the monster manual for Numenera, they're gonna take all those monsters and give them 5e stats, as well as other science fiction-y things. So I think there's gonna be some magic items in there that are science fiction-y. So you can, you can play your, you can basically play uh, with creatures, devices, and technologies that are from Numenera into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. And I thought this was really interesting because if like, if you like that kind of sci-fi technology as magic world, that uh, Numenera is the game to play. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to take that concept and then translate it over to be like well we'll just we'll bundle it with the world's most popular role-playing system basically like 5e yeah. is kind of at the top right now so why don't we just make a book for 5e you know using yeah. this stuff that we've already kind of created we just have to like change the stats on it well and there's what, what i thought was interesting is monty cook bruce cordell were heavy into third edition fourth edition content creation so they are full-on stalwarts of dungeons and dragons and he started turning 
some of the more fantastical worlds and were part of some of those more fantastical and weird um, adventures and stories and monsters that were being created. They started to kind of switch d d from that, from like what I always thought of was like the Gary Gygax Greyhawk, which was more like the Greyhawk kind of Dungeons and Dragons, maybe um, low fantasy or maybe a mid-ish fantasy, but maybe a dark and grim, maybe Conan-like in some ways. But then you start to get to more high fantasy a little bit as you get into third edition and fourth edition, and you get into, like like you said, kind of like the sci-fi or sci-fantasy almost, or they, they kind of mix those words. And so it was really interesting to me because I like Monty Cook and the games that they create, but he does create weird things. Like that's their stick. I think that's their, their idea when they said they left um, Dungeons and Dragons or, and, and Wizards of the Coast, TSR. I think they were with Wizards of the Coast. I don't think they were with TSR. But um, it was about because they wanted to explore those weird and strange ideas, and they didn't quite fit into Dungeons and Dragons, but they still wanted to explore those storylines, those type of creatures, those type of worlds, and mm-hmm. they wanted to build a game. So that's really, it's interesting, but they're kind of still part of that community in, in some ways they're as much as a creator of dungeons and dragons as a chris perkins is as a mike merles at this point because they've created full-on adventures and books and all kinds of stuff as much as any of those two have too and to, to have them kind of come back i wonder if a meeting was meant at some point where they said hey guys it's been a while what do you think about doing something just you know 5e for us just as a one-off as a we're all still friends we're all still buddies we all still work together type thing or was it like you said Hey, you want to get your psi weird into D and D? Let's make a D and D book because it's the most popular one. But I wonder if it was more about the the already personal relationships they had. They're all you know coworkers and still I assume friends at this point. I don't think it was like a bad breakup or anything like that. No. Well, it's so it's going to be a Kickstarter. It's going to go up in March with a 2020 release date. Um, so I really feel like it was just kind of like, Hey, we like, you know, people have been doing 5e supplements. They've been pretty successful. IE like Matt Colville did a 5e supplement and it was really successful. So like, why don't we dip our hands into this? And there isn't a true science fiction setting for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Not that Numenera, like, and and I say that and people are going to be like, Numenera is not science fiction. It's this fantasy magic is technology thing, but, but. I think it's going to be more science fiction-y than traditional Dungeons and Dragons is. Yeah. So I don't know, but like Monty Cook makes great games. I was really curious about their Invisible Sun game that was mm-hmm. kickstarted. And that's still something that I'm like, I think they're going to do another uh, batch of that. And so yeah. a part of me is like, do I really want to drop like $300 on it? Like, will I, I do want to drop $300 on it, but I want to be guaranteed that I'm going to be able to play it with some friends. Yeah. And that's where I don't know if that's actually going to happen. Like if I actually buy this, will I be able to play it? Yeah. <laughs> so I need to like well, get some people together and be like, are you in? Are you in? I need like mm-hmm. contract signs so that I know that if I drop this much money on an RPG, we're playing it. A lot too, yeah. because like all the money, although we've, we've dropped a lot of money on D and D books, but yeah, that's, that's probably our whole collection from last year. You might have spent three hundred dollars, but it's everything you need for that Invisible Sun game. Um, <laughs> that's true. And if you're curious about Invisible Sun, I think uh, is it WebDM that's running uh, an Invisible Grant Sun does, game? Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you look up Grant Ellis, who's doing a bunch of uh, Invisible Sun campaigns online, if you want to see him, Monty Cook always puts theirs where he plays with him, Bruce, mm-hmm. Shauna, and some of the office staff there and the producers there, and so you can always see actually the the designers playing and the, and the way they, I think they see it, but then it's also nice to see how other people have taken it and then they change it and do it their way. Too. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I mean more, I'm always a fan of having more monsters and this will get into later. I want to talk about like being surprised with monsters in Dungeons and Dragons because I've read the monster manual. I'm really familiar with it. I run a lot of D and D. So when I play D and D it's always nice to be surprised by a monster. I'm like, Oh, I don't, I don't actually know what we're fighting right now and whether my dungeon master puts like a silly hat on an existing monster or it's a completely new monster. I love that feeling. And so I think this is like, this is going to be good for Jordan because it's another, it's another monster manual that I'll be unfamiliar with. So yeah. um, And those, and those seem to be popular. And I think it was interesting. I think another reason I wanted to put it on our show notes was that just a week or so ago, we were talking about how acquisitions Inc is going to do a D and D book. We've got now Monty Cook Games, which is a big RPG game company. They're doing their D&D book. Um, 
and we're just seeing Matt Colville did his D and D book. I'm waiting for, you know, all these other people. I had somebody send me a whole new supplement in, um, uh, Twitter to say, Hey, I'm doing this supplement as a bunch of stuff. Would you take a look at it? I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I'll take a look at it. And there's like the retro is based on five E and there's all these games. And what was the other one? Sys Genesis, or there's like, there are some ones that are, everybody's converting five E. It's just because it is a po- It is the most popular game, but I also think after playing a lot of these games now, and I love Numenera and I love all these other games, five E is really a good game in its core. So when you wrap it in whatever dressing it might be, Mm -hmm. whether it's you could do Wild West with a 5e rule set, you could do anything. The core system is really tight right now that it feels good that it can fit in all these other things. And I always think of Eberron a little bit as being like sci fantasy, too. I think that I know steampunk is a little bit different or or that you know victorian technology kind of thing isn't quite science fiction but i to me it, it is kind of science fiction so that even that's kind of a bent for for that so we're seeing a lot of people expand the regular world i think it's a i don't know if it's that people are maybe i don't think they're tired of forgotten realms but i think it's a lot of people are wanting to explore other worlds and not just be contained in the very basic lord of the rings style fantasy i think they want they want to add like little dips of things. And I think that's why you get like um, um, Strahd being so popular because you get D and D, but it's dipped in with a little bit of vampire horror, Gothic coolness. You get uh, Eberron is D and D, but it's dipped in with a little bit of, you know, steam technology or a tiny bits of technology dumped in or magic done in a different way. And then, you know, you get all these things and I think it's just really little sprinklings of things getting dropped in now to, to keep the 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 whole hobby just exciting and for people to keep wanting to play and tr- really explore they don't have to just explore you're an elf i'm a dwarf we got a human cleric and we're doing this one thing which is fun and i love and i do that all the time and i'll and i'll do it till the end of time probably but it's also cool to say well what would happen when this little new thing happens this little oh, wait a minute, we have lightning trains that take us somewhere, or we have uh, spell jammer ships, or we have, you know, add some horror in, or add some science in, or add some modern day in, some portal jumping or whatever. I think that, yeah, I think that's the natural transition for everybody who plays RPGs. Like, you all start out with your generic fantasy, and then you're just like, wait a minute, we can play, like, Cthulhu horror? Like, I want to do that. Or, like, wait a minute, we can play, like the weird West. And so you start playing deadlands or you start playing this and like, uh, this invisible sun, uh, RPG for Monty cook is kind of the same thing where it's like, like he creates a whole new world and you're like, that just sounds interesting. I want to play in that world. Like, I want to see like, what are we doing in that? Like mechanic wise, how are we playing in that world? Um, and you're right. 5e is very like, they, they did a lot of good play testing with it and it's very honed and it's very good. And it's also, familiar and so i think that's another thing that another reason they're making this book is like they're going to tap into a larger rpg market rather than just the numenera market um and that's not necessarily like money or a cash grab but that is uh just this is the market like these are the people that are playing rpgs like let's let's build a book for people that are playing these rpgs so yeah and i think a lot of these people are now reaching out for certain segments of hey we have let's say it's millions of DD players and within that genre there's this group that really likes uh the vampire stuff also so when they do curse of Strahd, they're really into that and they're really cool and they're mm-hmm. really all about that but then you have this other group that's about hey it'd be cool that when we were underground and we we found this um dungeon it really turned out to be an illithid spell jammer ship that had crash landed a million years ago or something that and there's there's a group of people that would love that story Mm -hmm. um or the dark sun stuff or the this and that and i think these books are just targeting those little segments of that overall big pie i don't think they're trying to like get everybody in it they're just like hey we know there's a segment that like weird stuff here's a here's a 5e version of weird stuff Every, we know there's people like technology here's a 5e version of technology stuff you know or whatever it might be or horror or i'm trying to think of historical or western or you know whatever it might mm. be. so Makes me, I, I think it's cool yeah it reminds me of and i can't think of it but there was a, a marvel event a marvel comic book event where there was all these fractured worlds so you had old man logan old man wolverine in the wild west and you had like a bunch of other stuff and maybe chat can help me out. I can't remember. 
um, exactly what the event was, but that was, that's like the, the fracturing that is, uh, the good fracturing. I shouldn't say it's a negative thing, but like the, the splitting off that is role-playing games where they're like, we're going to do all these different things. So. Or like a, a really super relevant one is Spider-Verse, right? Yeah. If everybody went and saw the Spider-Verse, it was all the different worlds of Spider-Man, all the different ways. And you had noir and you had hyper anime technology and you had regular regular Peter Parker. You had old dude Peter Parker. You know, you had all these different things. And it was like appealing to the different comic book fans of all the different Spider-Man franchises that have been out there. Because there were people who loved the newer one. It wasn't the, all of the Spider-Man fans that loved it but there was a, a big enough group that said we love this stuff we'd love to have more of that and then you bring it all together in these in, in that movie it, it just shows that we like to add in many of our hobbies together and a lot of times we have a couple of them that we want to smash together we're all about smashing things together i think as, as gamers. <laughs> like we want to pull little pieces in and say oh i really like this i think that's why i was so excited about the dungeons and dragons and then some of the magic the gathering coming in mm. using the ravnica world because it was pulling in two hobbies that I like and it was bringing them together in a way that we could try to do something. And I know on this show, we've talked really highly about it. Now I realize there's lots of people out there that might say, I hate it. And I get it because that's taste, right? You can you can like apple pie. I can like, you know, whatever other type of pie there is and that's okay. It's just a taste thing. But I just think it's great that we have this big, huge assortment. We're like in the, the ice cream store, the Ben and Jerry's, where there's so many different flavors, everybody's going to find something there. You know, yeah. there's something out there that is going to be like your jam and you're going to love it, even though it's a couple of things mashed together. And I think that's cool. TTRPGs are just everybody's getting in on the on the game. There's independent big studios creating stuff like you said, Kickstarters are going, the big studios are building out books. There's not enough time for us to play all this really cool stuff at this point, but I think that's great. So we got more 5e books coming out even, and we'll still have regular Dungeons and Dragons 5e book if they ever announce it in the next month or so. <laughs> we'll have another one of those. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit. I think the other thing that I wanted to mention too, that I don't know if it was really news, but I, I did see it a lot on Twitter and I saw it advertised on YouTube a couple of times, commercial wise. It was a big deal that there was a big group of celebrities playing Dungeons and Dragons on the Big Bang Theory on, I think it was oh, a Friday yeah. night. And I don't even normally watch the show, but like I saw it everywhere. And I was just like, it was funny because they had like Will Wheaton and and William Shatner and Joe, who I always get his last name wrong. So I hope I never meet him in person. <laughs> punch me. But, he, you know, and he's everywhere just getting D&D out. Like he's getting the movie pushed forward. He's telling everybody about it. He talks about it on sets and everything. Um, I thought that was really cool. So I thought if anybody had seen that, I didn't watch the episode yet. I'm going to wait to see if it pops up on Hulu or somewhere where I can watch it. And then, uh, cause I don't normally watch the show, but I think, well, it's about D and D. So I got to see how this goes. Just like when community did their D and D episode, it blew me away. Or, you know, um, Reno nine one one did a D and D episode where they got called to the scene of a dungeon master hitting his player with a battle ax and trying to explain like a real one. And there's blood everywhere. And he's trying to explain, no, I rolled a 20. It was a crit. And it, it just that kind of stuff where they bring in the Dungeons and Dragons, Stranger Things. They bring in Dungeons. I got to watch it. Like, I got to go and mm-hmm. see. Uh, I guess I hope something. the animated cartoon again at some point. <laughs> I guess something else that uh, popped up on this radar. I don't know if it was this week or last week, but we haven't talked about it. Is they are making a Stranger Things uh, D&D uh, intro cool. set. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, and I forgot about that until just now. But um, mm-hmm. it comes with a couple of minis, a little demogorg mini, and something else. Um, and I'm I have no no clue what the adventure is, but it's going to be like Lost Minds of Fandelver, like it's an intro adventure for D and D. And I think it probably comes with everything you need to play. So probably a set of dice, um, characters, sheets, pre generated characters, and the adventure itself. But that's kind of yeah. exciting and really cool. A good and, starter set. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, and it's. In. It's one of those things where I'm like, I don't need this, but I really want it now. Want, they, like, yeah, like, I don't need it. the introductory <laughs> set. I play it all the time. If I compl- I say sometimes I'm an expert, but I want it. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I really need it. Got a compl- It's that collection thing. Like you're like, but I could yeah. I could have it on my shelf, and it would look so cool. So it would look yeah, um, right behind it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I thought that was interesting that they were like, oh yeah, let's team up with Netflix and actually like make a like because. I, I wonder how much Stranger Things has helped the hobby. Like, people are just like, oh, because they don't 
actively play D and D. There's just a lot of D and D references within Stranger Things, so it always makes me wonder if that like people were like, "Well, I want to play D and D because the Stranger Things guys were playing D and D," um, even though their adventure well, has it? It nothing really to do with D and D. Yeah, of season one is like they're at the table, the dice are rolling, they have a map out, they have character sheet, you know, like you, you see the full experience and then it does jump from there. And then it, you're right, it's just references. And I was surprised that season two had almost little D and D references, almost not very many at all. I, I really thought they were gonna lean on that again in the second uh, season they didn't. I, I would kind of wish they had. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I think it was popular enough that Netflix can generate some buzz. Like right now, the the big buzz out there that everybody's been watching is that Umbrella Academy. And I was just like, I, I keep hearing about it. We've been watching. I've been loving the show. It's come out of nowhere on Netflix. And it made me like, oh, it's a Dark Horse comic. Now maybe I should go check out that Dark Horse comic. So they have this power that if they put out a pretty good show all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, it could just drive a ton of stuff. So that was cool that Stranger Things was able to do that and you know, um, revitalize. Cause I think that was a big part. I know a lot of people say critical role, but I still feel like stranger things made it cool again. That's what was like, I want to get back into it. This show's mm-hmm. good. Everybody likes it. They talk about it and, Oh, I can go find games to play online. And now maybe I find this other stuff. I think that was, you know. well, nerd culture now is popular because yeah. all of those nerds from the 80s and 70s grew up and now they're producing content like Stranger Things and stuff like that. Um, so it was interesting to go back to, you know, let's harken back to what we did as a kid in the 80s. We played D&D and we'll have this sci-fi kind of uh, uh, story to tell about, you know, Hawkins, Indiana or wherever it is. Where, wherever it is. Um, but I think a lot of people identified with that where they're like, well, I did that when I was a kid. And is it still cool? Is it still something to do? Or you have like younger kids that are just like, oh, look, like kids in the 80s were doing the same thing. Like we should try it out. So, but yeah, it's yeah. fun. Uh, obviously, DD is fun. Stranger Things is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. Umbrella Academy. I've, I've got like one episode down and not that this is the Umbrella Academy podcast, but uh, I'm but it excited to keep watching. Because I love the show so much <laughs> that I'm ready to talk about it a lot, but we won't. But I mean, I love the show. I We're at episode nine. Oh, and you're way far. Good. It is super good. No <laughs> I like the comic nothing. back in the day. I read a, hey, a comic Hey, we got a there. raid going on. Welcome, everybody. From well, welcome. Waco Matrixio, or I might say that wrong. Welcome over to the Saturday morning D and D show. We're talking about playing set, you know, D and D and the news. We just got done with. We're transitioning now uh, to our week in Dungeons and Dragons and the stuff that me and Jordan do as far as running games or playing any games. Yeah. So speaking of that, what did you do running yeah. or playing games this week, Mr. Lucian? Well, as you know from last week's show, I was sick, so I postponed my games mostly for the beginning of the week, and it wasn't until the end of the week that I finally got some cool stuff in. So the cool thing was, um, oh, my Tuesday game, that is the Adventure League game where I was playing my Barbarian. Sadly, a moment of silence has been canceled. The show has been cut. (laughs) We, uh, I don't even know if I want to go into the things that are going behind it, nothing bad, but it was just decided that the show um, needed to stop at this point. Okay. And so we were all like, okay, you know, it was all, everybody left on good terms and everything. And it was just, it was time to let that one stop. So my barbarian Racky, who was just had made ninth level, we won't see if they actually get into the tomb of annihilation Mm. or unless I take him somewhere else and maybe try to get him in another tomb of annihilation. So that got canceled. So that was kind of like my downer. And I was feeling down about it because I really liked the game. And an artist is a great GM. And he'll probably be doing some more stuff um, uh, TTRPG-wise in that time slot coming up. Maybe I'll be in that game. We'll see. Um, so then Thursday, though, I got to play on the Encounter Roleplay channel over with uh, Susanna Grace, who was the DM. And she was running a game that I thought was really interesting. And I wanted to talk about it for sure because... It was very different, and it was playing Dungeons & Dragons in a very Terry Pratchett world. So I'm hoping, Jordan, you're a huge Terry Pratchett fan, and you know what I'm talking about when I say a Terry Pratchett world. Uh, I I know of Discworld, (laughs) and I know that they're books, 
but no. I have never read one, uh, even though they are on my to read list because I had two roommates uh, at different times that were obsessed with those books. But right. sadly, I have not read them. Yeah, my wife loved them a lot. She'd, she'd showed me to them because I was reading fantasy books, but I was reading more like, you know, J.R. Tolkien or, you know, Sword of Shannara or, you know, all these other older fantasy books. And she's like, oh, you should read these Pratchett books. Well, it's a fantasy with a lot of pop culture humor mixed in. Mm-hmm. Um, very British, very British humor to it. A uh, very funny world. Everybody that I've heard that's actually read even one of the books loves them just because it's just whimsical. Um, it's got a lot of funny references that you get and it's just really well written. So I'm sitting there and when I got invited to play on the show, I didn't know what kind of campaign it was. I didn't go and watch the previous weeks. I didn't go and see, I didn't really read any much. I just said, Hey, bring a fifth level character. You get, here's roll your stats. Here's, you know, do whatever you want to do. You get one magic item from this chart or this chart and be ready to go. I'm like, okay, I, I created a dragonborn sorcerer that I've been wanting to play. Um, that was all kind of lightning based. And I had this really cool idea about everything having to do with lightning. It was a blue dragonborn. Mm-hmm. And so I had this really serious um, character in mind. And I'm sitting there in the lobby of we're getting ready for the show to start. They're all chit chatting with each other. A few of them had been on the show a couple of times, but they're not really talking about the game. So we're leading into the game. I have the character. We do the introductions. I still have no idea what style of game we're going to play. And we jump right into it and they immediately start doing really Terry Pratchett kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's do a full reverse on what I was thinking my character was like. Let's (laughs) jump right in and make this really fun and really have a good time with it. It was really cool because it, it showed me, and the reason I wanted to bring it up in the show, not just to plug another show that I was on or that I got to play in in another game, but during it, I realized that Dungeons and Dragons can be played in very different ways. This was a very comical, very whimsical, very comedic way. Everybody was laughing and making inside jokes. And there was our bad guy had, uh, our bad guy was basically a PewDiePie stand in who was making videos of pranks. And we were the police that were supposed to stop the pranks from happening type thing in dungeon but it was all wrapped in a fantasy world dungeons and dragons and who knows they had a tablet that was a magical tablet that allowed him to capture video stuff so that was the (laughs) whole so it was like this really weird sort of pop culture reference sort of you know it's still dungeons and dragons i still have a sorcerer who's throwing lightning and doing all kinds of cool stuff um and we had it was just really fun so and it reminded me that when i run a game and i run dungeons and dragons and i think up a campaign I kind of play the more serious campaign. I play the more, I want it to be like Black Company. I want it to be like Lord of the Rings. I want it to be like um, Dragonlance. I want it to be like these fantasy books that you read that have more serious Epic adventures. Yeah, but that's just, you know, because in my mind, that's what I'm thinking about these adventures and dungeons and bad guys and storylines. My mind kind of goes that way automatically, but I forget that there's just, funny and comical or there's or like you know we were just talking about having sprinkling horror or sprinkling science fiction or or whatever there's lots of different ways to play dungeons and dragons it just it was a great reminder in the middle of the week to say oh that's right you can just play a very funny dungeons and dragons game it doesn't just have to be tactical combat it doesn't just have to be grand wide scopes of saving the world before it ends it can be just just off the wall bonkers and it was fun to kind of play that game and sit i thought Susanna grace was a great dungeon master who really allowed us to do lots of stuff she even in the beginning she was just like if you want to do something cool i want you to do something cool so let's just try to make something cool happen i just thought that was a cool speech to give to the players in the beginning now they they did make some choices that i thought um i wanted to kind of talk about now they're running an online show which I do quite a bit of. Jordan, you were thinking about doing some more of this. You've been in some of our online games. You've been in plenty of other online games with other groups. So you'll know what I'm kind of talking about here. Um, The setup was uh, uh, videos like we have here, overlays, and then they were using fantasy grounds to roll dice, but not to do anything else. So there was no maps. There was no, we didn't put character sheets in. Um, We didn't do that. So 
it was interesting for me, who's a big Roll20 fanatic at mm-hmm. this point, and I'm like a, I'm like a uh, Roll20 cleric at this point. I like preach the word to everybody because I love it so much in all of my games. Um, it was interesting to go to Fantasy Grounds, which I have seen other groups do, and I think you even played in Fantasy Grounds, yeah. um, to see it from that range. But then also, because I, we didn't put our character sheets in there, I used D&D Beyond on my tablet next to me um, to keep track of my character sheet. So I built my character for the first time on D&D Beyond. I hadn't used that yet, which was another thing that I think has been super popular to bring to like your table and have your character sheet there so you don't have to have it printed out. You don't have to have your pencil. You can just have it on. So I, I was mixing lots of these technologies. I'm mixing a, a tad of Fantasy Ground, a little bit of D&D Beyond, We've got a video conferencing screen going on. We're streaming live of a game. It's all theater of the mind. There's no real maps or anything going on. And I just thought it was interesting the different ways and the different tools you have available to you and the mixing and matching. Like there's not like just this, it's not all one. All these different shows have some variation of Mm -hmm. these different technology pieces that kind of help us run these games. And I, th- I was wondering, you've now played Roll20, you've now used Fantasy Grounds and a couple of the other campaigns you were on. You play sitting at your table. What is the technology that's standing out to you nowadays? What are you leaning towards? Because I'm still leaning towards Roll20 as my go-to. Yeah. So, well, no, it's you- interesting. Like, so I played a... I played DCC this week because uh, a patron of mine was like, hey, I, I can't find a third person to make this this dcc game this dungeon crawl classics game happen and he's like do you want to play in it and i'm like you know what i do that sounds awesome so we played on roll 20 and i forget how like if you do everything in roll 20 it's really cool like i still don't know exactly how to make macros but you can like refine all your stuff so that if i want to sneak i just hit this button if i want to do this i just hit this button rather than trying to like look at your character sheet what die do i roll for this what's my modifier for this but I definitely like playing at the table the most. Um, I like the tactile feel of dice. And some of my favorite games that I've played on the internet have been just like roll dice. Like we didn't even use roll 20. We did, we had physical dice at my desktop here and I had my little dice tray. I'm, I'm gesturing this way, but I was like, I had my little Mm -hmm. dice tray and I would roll dice and uh, have my character sheet over here. And we would just like, we were at the table chatting with everyone. And I, I like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. it is, there's a, there's a certain charm to it. And fantasy grounds was the same way, but like, like, I don't know, technology at the table, like right now, um, my Sunday game that I'm playing on and off again, when I can't play betrayal, uh, betrayal legacy with my other group, um, they're getting really into D and D beyond, um, because Mm -hmm. the dungeon master has bought, uh, D and D beyond. And I think he's paying the monthly fee to then share it out with his players. So like we can create characters on D and D beyond now. And one of them is like gung ho. And the last time we played, he did everything from his phone. He had his character sheet on his phone. He was doing spells from his phone and he's a wizard and stuff. And I was sitting there with my printed paper and I'm like, I still really like having this physical (laughs) thing that I can write on. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, like, yeah. There's a point where technology doesn't seem to help me with role-playing games. Cause at the end of the day, I'm like, I still really like having my paper and I still like that. Am I old fashioned? I don't know, but I don't yeah. like the idea of having even a tablet at the table and doing this. Now my brain is just going to different directions, but like uh, I have a dice rolling app on my phone mm. and there's been a couple times where I am like, for instance, uh, I had a, an ability that one of my characters had that hurled somebody. It was a monster that hurled that would send somebody through the nine hells. So they would disappear. They would get hurled through the nine hells. They would reappear and take 10 D 10 damage. I didn't want to roll 10 D 10 dice and add it all up. So I used my dice rolling app to be like, okay, I've got 10. I hit the button. It tells me I did like 48 points of damage. So I like using it for things like that for big dice rolls. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think on that spectrum, like you said, of the we'll never have technology in our game spectrum, and then we're going to use technology for every single thing possible, like some of the games I've been running lately, <laughs> because character sheets, rolling dice, the screen, the way we get together is all technology based. On that spectrum, I'm in there where 
I think I'm on the other side of it. I think I'm really liking technology mm -hmm. because of <clears throat> the convenience of it, but the safety of it in some ways and the non um, stress of it, <clears throat> the stress of having people in your house, stress of cleaning up after everything's gone. Um, you are rolling dice, which is fun, but then that introduces if you're using character sheets, are you getting it right? If there's so many bonuses you're adding up or whatever. But when I'm using a roll 20 character sheet, I click sword and it does the sword thing. I click fireball and it does the fireball thing. And it kind of helps you with the rules. And as a dungeon master, I get less questions in roll 20 from my players about how things work yeah. than if I'm at a table because now not everybody has access to all of these quick little helpful things or the things are being done for them so that they can focus on what do I want to do and not focus on how is the game want me to do that? They want me to roll a 20 with advantage. I get a plus two for this. Oh, and the bard gave me inspiration. So now I get a, a D six for this or whatever. There's a lot going on there um, that I still like, and I still think it's fun. And, I, and when I'm sitting at conventions and playing at this point, or that's really the only place I'm getting sit down games at this point. Cause I can't get my friends schedules to match together that everybody could come over to my house on a Sunday afternoon and play, but I can get lots of games online to play and I can get my friends in those games cause they don't have to leave their house. So I feel like I'm there and I feel like I've been a D and D beyond detractor because I've been so excited about using roll 20 and how it's helped me play games and run games and, and host games for mm -hmm. our viewers and stuff. And it makes it easy and I can do it with lots of different games, but having forced to be during that Wednesday night game to use um, D and D beyond on my tablet, I found it like, Oh, all right. So from now on, if I'm going to go and sit and play at a table, I think I'm going to start using D and D beyond on a tablet. I still want paper for like, I think writing notes I still like the idea of, like you said, physical dice is where it's at. I love the idea of having a couple 20s in your hand. You roll them. I like watching them roll. I like hearing them roll. I bought a dice tower so I could drop them in the dice tower and, and watch them do the whole thing. I love the whole mechanics of that part. Um, but there is something to be said about an app or something that helps you with the math or helps you with getting the rule right, or helps you with, like you said, the addition. So I don't have to look at the 10 dice I just threw it and we can just move on and keep the game flowing and keep the game moving. Um, so it's very interesting. I think what I pulled out of that was all these different shows, all these different ways to play and all these different mixing and matching of technology or not technology to play a game. It's amazing that when we say, hey, I play Dungeons and Dragons, and you say you play Dungeons and Dragons, sometimes we're getting very different experiences. Like sometimes it's it's different in many ways. Well, um, that's just we, like but, theater of the mind or like, are you miniature heavy? Like even at the table, it can be very different. Or do you do yeah. a mixture of both? Like we only set up miniatures and maps for big boss battles. But like those mm -hmm. four goblins that you found on the road, like we're not going to, I'm not going to draw that. Like we're just yeah. going to play that. So. Oh yeah, you know, like Danimal just mentioned in chat. The thing I love the most is initiative tracker. It's the easiest can possibly be on Roll Twenty, mm -hmm. where I watch people are doing it live. They're they're messing with stuff on their chart, and they're it's like this whole thing of of two minutes of trying to figure out who's going when and like who's twenty to twenty five, which seems to be the they were doing that in this game. There was like, okay, who has twenty five to twenty? I'm just thinking that seems like a really slow way to try to figure out initiative order but i guess if there's you know no mechanical way or no app that's helping everybody do that that i also heard from some dms that do a lot of online stuff that when they play at the table they're just like lost because they're used to having their three monitors and they've got this window open here they've got their show notes over here they've got like the mm -hmm. actual game going there and so it's a little weird to be like okay i've got my physical book i have to flip through it i, I don't have D, D beyond to like help me with this rule or something like that but right. well what, here's here's the question what was the original piece of technology that we got with dungeons and dragons to help us play for, as a dungeon master the original piece an eraser the, i don't know where you're going with this <laughs> no the dm screen in front of oh us, yeah yeah it's an analog version of a of a pad and on those you needed to interact with them and it had the stuff you needed to typically keep a game running i don't know if they do that now right because we know some of the rules but what are the rules that we need to keep track of it's like the monster stats what what do these spells do? No, they do. Like I'm the our the 
DM screen I have doesn't have spells and stuff, but it has like, here's levels of exhaustion and what happens at each level. That's and here, one. you know, things like things that are kind of generic, but it, every, every time wizards comes out with a new adventure, they come out with a new dungeon master screen that's tied to that adventure. So ah. you could get the Waterdeep Dragon Heist Dungeon Master screen that has very pertinent information to running Waterdeep Dragon Heist. So, yeah. See, I haven't got any of that stuff because I don't run enough games yeah. at my table. I don't even yeah. see that. So I like, that was the interesting thing, yeah. I like to play, if I'm, using, if I'm using technology like this DCC game that we were playing, like I like to use Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. So if I'm using Fantasy Grounds, I would like to go all in and have my character sheet there so that I can set up macros, so that I can click this and my sneak attack damage is applied automatically and things like that. So I like I like using that, but um, but overall, I think I just like playing at the table more. So I yeah. don't know. Yeah, I hear you. I'm not talking you out yeah. of it. <laughs> no, 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 but, but it is fun. And you definitely, playing online has super benefits with the people you can play, probably a more reliable schedule because you just have a larger pool of people that are willing to, you'll find more people that are as into D and D as you are than you mm -hmm. will probably in your community. So I keep finding people that are in D and D more than I am. And I can't believe it because I'm <laughs> super into D and D. So the last thing on that, uh, that Thursday game that I was gonna bring up, if you define the Jordan style of games, the couple that you are running currently okay. now, how much on the scale of zero humor to bonkers humor, where's your campaign falling humor wise? Are your players doing a lot of, you know, pop culture jokes? Is it a lot of just funny stuff? Or are you guys more on the serious side? Where Where's your campaigns at as far as humor level? I think when I started Dungeons and Dragons, it was because I really liked the Acquisitions Incorporated stuff. And that is like bonkers humor. Like it's yeah. really like they're just making all kinds of references and just being funny. And I wanted that experience at the table. So I think when I started my campaign, it was very much like that, but it slowly evolved to be more serious. Like everyone's uh -huh. kind of taken like, we have to save the world guys. Like things are, things are dangerous here. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I think they're more serious. They're still, we laugh at the table all the time. Like things right. are funny. Things are just always going to be funny and we're going to make jokes about it. But, um, but even hot Springs Island, I mean, they're just like, we have to save these ogres. Like they're being enslaved by this guy and we have to like, we have to help them rise up against the villain and we're going to take them out rather. I mean, they think there's a lot of money in there, so they're aiming for getting paid, but at the end of the day, they're doing it pretty selflessly to just be like, it's the right thing to do. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I was just wondering, because I've realized that mine, I, we, we tell jokes, and there's a yeah. lot of laughing here or there when something goofy happens, but for the most part, my players are into it, and they're serious. Like, they're fighting beastmen that are, you know, being ran by a demon that they have to stop this thing from like you said conquering the world they're thinking about it offline they're talking about how they're going to go back and try to destroy the thing and they're into it so they're on that more serious side and it was it's interesting to to like you said play in the game like i love ac inc totally i would sit there with i could play dnd with jerry hopens forever because mm -hmm. of how funny he is and the stuff that they bring up um i would love a game like that even though i don't play that game i just realized even though I love that style, that's not the style I play. I, I play a more serious game and my players play a more serious game. It but reminds it just... me of uh, playing in Nerd Immersion's 24 hour game that he did. The whole thing was bonkers. Like it was Christmas right. themed and they killed a, a boule monster and they ended up like transmogrifying it or tapping into it somehow, like with a physical beer tap and they turned it into a creme brulee. And right. like, just like joke after joke after joke. And we did all these like yeah. Christmas theme jokes. Um, and that was really fun. And I had a blast. I think the Dragon Balls showed up in that game. Like people were making <laughs> Dragon Ball wishes. It was just hilarious. So yeah. lots of pop culture references. And um, those games can be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I don't know if they can carry themselves for a longer term game. And maybe that's why my funny game turned into a more serious game. Because at the end of the day, it's like, well, we have to save the world. Whereas yeah. it's just like, I don't know, gingerbread men are attacking the city. What do we do? Kind of a thing. Right, so. right, right. And I think too, like it's the type of players and the GM having that kind of agreement that that's the game they want to play. 
and like you know like you've coalesced into the game that you all like to play and you are playing that and my players that i have cultivated like to be very serious into the combat in the in the game and the series and i like to run that game so it all works we're not we're not like um i don't want to say meshing is means it's together but the opposite of meshing mm -hmm. like there's friction between oh the dm wants to run a funny game but he's got a whole bunch of players that want to play a serious full-on tactical assault game and that's not that's not coming together right so uh so i just thought it was cool i thought yeah. it was fun to play it was made me think throughout the week about playing dungeons and dragons differently and using um a lot more humor i think i feel like like you said i want to do some one-offs where we get a little bonkers and and i had so much fun and at the end of it when the show had stopped everybody had took a deep breath without on no cueing or anything everybody took a deep breath and they're like oh my god my face hurts because we're smiling so much and we're laughing and joking and just trying to make nice. as many inside jokes as we could and there was a really good feeling about that's how the show had ended like the the cameras are off the the group of people that are sitting around the virtual table are just like oh my god that was super funny and now my face hurts and mm -hmm. they, they were like that's a good game if your face hurts it's a good game yeah so yeah just like really refreshing and i think something i need to do a little more of that i haven't done and, and reminded me to maybe try it out as a, as a gm at some point so other than that um tonight i'm gonna run a seeking revenor game so we're gonna run back out and we're gonna get the players back they've been chomping at the bit they send me messages constantly because i didn't schedule a game last week these are rabid players that want to play i get messages daily from them when's the next game when's the next game when's the next game they are currently RPing the funeral of one of the player who died several sessions ago because they cannot stop RPing for even a second. They just keep going. So in our Discord channel, it's RP session after RP session because they couldn't get to play. They're doing the funeral of the paladin and, and laying the paladin to rest. So it's really funny to see this really active group, this really into it group. And I know they want to play some more. So we're going to play tonight um, and we're going to do some more. My West Marches D&D 5e homebrew mishmash of uh, dark fantasy in a new world kind of thing. And then tomorrow, assuming I don't lose my voice from doing you know the three or four hours, we're going to try to play a game, which I keep missing because I got sick and we got pushed, but we're gonna be trying to play uh, World of Dungeons Breakers, which is a John Harper game um, that is a very quick three page RPG. So it's like oh, cool. all of it is in just a very short, small rule set you make characters quickly and i'm hoping that we can just sit down play learn it all at the same time because it is so small and just have a fun awesome little session on sunday to do that so that is all i had um but what about jordan's games i noticed you you were big on your dcc thing going on yeah hot yeah, springs no, island uh, hot springs what do you lots of stuff i played a lot of games now that i think yeah. about it like we played played dungeon crawl classics i played hot springs island or I DM'd Hot Springs Island. I played in my on again, off again Sunday game that's becoming more regular than I had anticipated. And I really like it because it's it's been a lot of fun. And I'm playing that Warforged Eldritch Knight. And we're running around in the Underdark. But uh, I guess dun on the topic of Dungeon Crawl Classics, it's. Uh, oh, hold on. Stream. Oh, stream. What? What? YouTube's you guys fine. Hear me yet? Oh, <laughs> op, back up. Somebody says it's back up. There we okay. go. Okay. So on the topic of Dungeon Crawl Classics, it's always beneficial to play in these games, uh, new games that you're trying to like figure out. And I've ran a couple sessions of DCC, but it's, it's fun to be on the other side of it. And we started with uh, three characters. So I was really confused because um, there's three players, but each of us have three playable characters in the game, level one characters. So I've got an elf, a wizard, and a thief. And the three of them, I'm trying to, like, protect them because they've got no health and stuff. But it's been, I don't know really where I was going with this other than I had a really good time with Dungeon Crawl Classics. <laughs> and, and it's good to play other games and it's good to be on the other side of the table. And I will say Roll20 handles DCC really well. So if you're interested in Dungeon uh -huh. Crawl Classics, you can totally utilize Roll20. And we don't, all three of us, or all four of us, the Dungeon Master and the three players, we don't have paid accounts or anything. So we're just doing kind of whatever and the dungeon master draws on the table and so we're we're making it work and it's and it's surprisingly working out really well so I'm, I'm always amazed when 
you don't have to dump a lot of money into roll 20 to make it work i guess was my point mm -hmm. so well in dcc it's interesting because you could say well it's just a role playing game why wouldn't it play well but dcc is interesting because it has different style of dice that you might not yeah. normally have had whereas if you go to some virtual tabletop and they only have the d20s the d8s and whatever they might not even thought of the other crazy dice that dcc yeah. and mcc you need d5s well, d7s yeah we probably should say what the name of the game is because maybe not everybody even knows dcc or mcc mutant crawl classics or dungeon crawl classics i know a lot of us like to use acronyms all the time because yeah. that's how we refer to no everything. dungeon crawl classics uh if you if you're new to the saturday morning D, &D show then that's what it's <laughs> called if you yeah. are not new jordan's been talking about this for probably 50 <laughs> episodes now so yeah. uh he really likes dcc and so. he still loves it <laughs> yeah and it's and it's still really good um hot springs island my players had a wish i think i told you guys about this yeah so um, here we go and they and I've been sweating this wish because I'm just like, I don't know what they're going to wish for. Like, what's what's out of the power possibility? Um, their first thought was to try and wish away their their debt to the Martell company. But I'm like, I can't just wave away the entire plot of the game. So I was like, that's that's with above her power. Like, she's unable to break this curse that you guys this magical contract that they're in. Um, so. Their next sex, their net, next idea was like, well, we'll wish for a lot of gold and we can use that gold to, to pay off our debt. And I was like, okay, that's kind of a, a smart idea. But ultimately they, they're convinced that the, there's a, an Afrit on the Island named Sparku, who is kind of a huge dick. And he's just like trying to manipulate everything, trying to control everything. He's mining the, the, the volcano for something and they don't really know why he's mining, but he's mining this red crystal for probably profit of some sort. So they're kind of convinced that he's got a lot of money, but they know that they, or they've assuming that they can't just walk in and, and take care of him because he's a really powerful, you know, the end guy of hot Springs Island. So they want allies. So they have been traveling to different areas of hot springs trying to make allies and the largest ally is going to be the night axe ogres who were former slaves of svarku but have since broken away and now they hate svarku unfortunately the tribes are divided and one half of the tribe is very like gung-ho and that leader wants to throw as many night axe ogres at a wall until that wall comes down and the other one is like, you know, I want to take out Svarku, but I don't want to do it at, at by sacrificing my people. Now, if the two of them came together, they probably would have a strong enough army to go against Svarku, but they're divided. One of them wants to be cautious. One of them wants to be gung-ho about it. So they figured the gung-ho guy, he's in. We, we, we have him on our side. So they go to the other tribe's leader and they say, what do we need to do to get you to be in? part of this and he says i need intel on svarku like we need to know how many people he has um what does his army look like uh what is the geographical layout of the thing so we know where to attack and what's the best of all this what's the best possible situation so that he can ha launch an attack but lose as as little of his tribe as he possibly can like that's what he wants to know he wants a sure thing and i was very surprised they decided collectively to use their wish to get intel on Svarku. So I have maps printed out of all of the different areas they can go to. So I basically took the maps of Svarku's lair and I'm like, this is what your wish has gained you. Like, you know exactly the in and outs of Svarku's lair. You know how many, how tall it is, how deep it is, all of this thing. You don't know necessarily enemies in there. And so that's their next step. And it was a really selfless wish. Like they're like, if with this, we can unite them, we can free the Night Axe Ogres, we can attack against Sparku. Um, so now Jordan has to create some kind of a system for war because they're going to come at it with like hundreds and hundreds of Night Axe Ogres against uh, Sparku's army of hundreds of hundreds of whatever. And I need to have some kind of a, like a military war mechanic. And I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with that yet. Thoughts? <laughs> you could always go to Matt Colville's warfare system. He released Does at he least have? a beta version of it, or at okay. least a pre version that you can find, um, which is a simplified version of doing warfare. Um, Cause I want I them to be like generals directing an army. Um, 
but yeah, I need to I need to reread Strongholds and Followers. People are telling yeah, me yeah, that it's in towards the chat. end. Yeah, it's towards <laughs> the end. There's a like there's a a sneak peek of the beginning of the rules. Hopefully, the next Kickstarter is going to be a much more expanded version of mm. that. And he's doing a little bit of it. He did a tiny bit of it in his campaign he's running now, where the chain have a unit of soldiers with them. So okay. they get, I think they have two units. They have like a unit of something and a unit of something that makes up the entire chain at the moment. And uh, that comes into play here and there. Yeah. So, um, but I have seen other supplements out there also that talk about that. Or you just go full cinematic. Is Because I've been thinking about it too, like, there's a, a style of campaign that I want to run where the players would run a mercenary company. Mm -hmm. They would be, you know, they would be part of it, but there would be lots of stuff going on. So what do I do with the players while all that stuff's going on? Cause I don't really just want them at the front line. What's going to happen. Or how do you describe a battle with D and D characters in it where it's, you look to the left, it's a thousand people. You look to the right, it's a thousand people and everybody's just banging and crashing into each other. And how do you do mm -hmm. that with rounds and turns and stuff? So I've also, also like you may be thinking about coming up with a hybrid or my own little homebrew of that's kind of what right, I have been. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take combat and find a cinematic way, a narrative way to tell this story, allow them to do things on their turn, but also maybe stretch how the turns work somehow or stretch what they can affect while explaining there's lots of chaos going on around them at the same time. So there's and probably a bunch of different ways. Um, part of me was leaning towards a skill challenge of sorts. Like, how are you going yeah. to direct your armies? Are you going to do it with, are you going to be at the forefront of them and use your athletic skill? Are you going to use charisma skills? Are you persuading them? Are you intimidating them into doing what you want them to do? And then, just to strategically where are you placing them on this battlefield against this mm -hmm. volcano and then have a, a list of random events and every once in a while I'll roll on the random event, like the volcano erupts or they end up like sweeping around the corner. Like how are you handling these, these random events that are coming into play as you're storming the castle, so to speak. Um, and then depending on that, have that turn into a, an encounter against like a group of enemies and then, mm -hmm. you know, so that they get their, their fix or not like they, they get their fix for fighting something. Cause they, it's not just this cinematic fight. They actually get to sit down and fight something. So, yeah, or you just break out your games workshop tabletop models and you put all the units out on the <laughs> table, you put them on the board and you have a full on tactical battle yeah. that decides. And then at the end of it, you're back to Dungeons and Dragons rules again. So you, there's probably lots of things you could do. I mean, think of it like how, how would Mike do it um, from Ack Inc.? Like, when he wanted to run a game and he put Mario Kart in Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. or he put, you know, this different stuff. Maybe there's a way that you could do it that way too, where you come at it from, I grab a different game that I like a card game. Yeah. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's some type of magic mechanic that's flipping around and playing and deciding those things. Or maybe it's dice rolls, like you say, or maybe it's dice pools, or maybe it's, um, all, you know, there's also kinds of cool things. I guess you have to figure it out pretty soon though. No, I do. Um, so they're, <laughs> they're going to, uh, they're going to do some reconnaissance now that they have the floor plan, they're going to break in. They're going to kind of check around, see what's going on, uh, maybe get some Intel and then they're going to try to escape. And that's when they're going to be like, listen, we need your help to, to come against like the, the big bad guy here. So. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Or or Roche and Bow, just do rock paper scissors for everything. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how everything's decided <laughs> as you go through. I love it, <laughs> but it's it's gonna be uh, a little sad because I think it's gonna be the end of Hot Springs Island once they once they come to this fruition. Like it it feels like a good so solid conclusion. The they have that was my question. They have not assumed wrong. He is the bad guy of the island. They've, They've assumed he's the bad guy of the island. But you say that as if he's not. They could easily have like <laughs> misinterpreted. If, well, no, not misinterpreted, <laughs> but if it depending on who you visit first, like they mm -hmm. could have visited Svarku's palace first by accident, got in a meeting with him. This is just how Hot Springs Island is set up. And he's saying, mm -hmm. you know, I've got this problem of these night axe ogres. They're causing me all kinds of issues. I need your help to take out of them. And then all of a sudden the night axe are the enemy. And yeah. so there's not, like Sparku, I would I would argue that Sparku's a bad guy, but is he like malevolently evil? 
like probably not. He's just he's got problems just like everybody else. And depending and on who the players, take him down. yeah. <laughs> and now they're raising an army to take him down. And he's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm just What's trying to mine up? from this island. Like, what are yeah. you talking about? We're all friends here. It's fine. Hey, so, I pay them great wages. What's the problem? <laughs> yeah, kind of a thing. So, so we'll see. And and like, I don't know. It's interesting. There's so many little little factions and stuff within Hot Springs Island that there there really isn't like the bad guy. It's it's who who does the players want to side with and and, yeah. and in my game the players met the night x ogres first they understood their like wow you guys were slaves they really identified because they're slaves themselves and so mm -hmm. they they have made a rep, uh, rapport with the night x ogres so yeah. it's interesting but that doesn't end the game when they get rid of them though right no not really it i mean yeah <laughs> i think it'll end the game just because it's a good stopping point but yeah. you could potentially keep playing. There's other factions to mess with. Yeah, so. when there's a power vacuum, somebody yep. steps in. One hundred percent. That's exactly it. Uh, that's uh, cool. Or there's other islands. Yeah, there are. Which hopefully they're making more for other islands. I heard that they were, because um, because my players found a teleportation circle that takes them to another island, but I don't have information on the other islands yet. So I had them like bounce off of a bubble that's kind of because hot springs island is encircled in this bubble that kind of prevents teleportation and so they hit the bubble and they were flung back down to the island but that's another story anyway <laughs> that's our show ladies and gentlemen that's uh our show. thank you so much for coming out thank you so much for uh chatting with us and and all this stuff both on youtube and on twitch we had an awesome raid so that was exciting uh it's just lots of fun to have you guys out here and chatting with us we do read the chat and we try to respond as much as possible um it's just fantastic that you're out here um mm -hmm. anything else before we we bounce sir no i can't wait to play some more dungeons and dragons coming up thanks for commenting on the youtubes and the vod's and stuff like you said or in twitter you can get a hold of us on twitter because we like to interact with our group um if you want to play in a campaign that i'm running you can you can sign up for it we've had a couple of people jump in a lot of the people in the channel right now are in that campaign and having fun in the Seeking Revenor campaign, which was a campaign I designed for our fans of the show. So you can come and play and try to, or at least try to play as much as I can get some time to run games for as many people yeah, as yeah. possible. <laughs> but other than that, I just wanted to say thanks for all the comments because I love going out to the YouTube videos and seeing all the people that are interacting that maybe weren't able to make it live. So you YouTuber fans out there that are maybe watching this a day or two later, Thanks. Also, we're, we're reading your comments. We're loving interacting with you guys. And uh, it's been great. Yeah, it's wonderful. So thank you guys so much. Uh, we will see you again next Saturday with another episode of the Saturday Morning D&D &D Show. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye.